going to start it off with um, a topic that was quite foreign to me, to be honest, which is bone health in women. Um, the topic is actually quite broad, so we can probably go on for three hours about it, which I won't. Um, so we're just going to point out the relevant basics, the basic concepts and how it applies to gynecology for us. And unfortunately, to approach this topic, we have to go back to maybe second year, maybe third year, I don't even remember, to bone biology. Um, so as we know, bone is actually a living tissue. It has its own blood supply and it's capable of change and remodeling um, and is importantly capable of transform, transformation and repair. The main functions, I apologize if it's a bit small. Oh no, you can read it, okay. So the main functions and structure of bone, we know that ba bone, wow, that bone um, supports our mobility, protects our vital organs, is the main storage component for our calcium and our, um, our phosphate. It also houses the bone marrow, which is important in the development of our hemopoietic cells. And in terms of structure, you have an outer periosteum of the bone. Um, which mainly provides support and then the inner cellular layer that eventually gives rise to all the bone cells that we'll talk about later. So our osteoclasts and osteoblasts. Don't know if you guys remember any of this. It was revision for me. And then of course we have the bone matrix, which is composed of both collagenous and non-collagenous proteins. And then the main mineral is the hydroxyapatite, which contributes to the hardness and the rigidity of the bone. And the crystalline complex is actually 70% of calcium, is 70% of calcified bone. So it's very important. A quick note on the osteoblasts and, or the bone cells rather. So the bone cells um, kind of work synergistically to both remodel and resorb bone. So the osteoblasts are mainly responsible for the bone matrix synthesis and the subsequent mineralization, whereas the osteocytes or osteoblasts that are incorporated within a formed osteoid and that eventually becomes calcium, bo calcified bone. And then of course osteoclasts are so very similar to macrophages, so they resorb bone um, and they are also derived from the hemopoietic lineage. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into the physiology, otherwise we'll be here the whole day. Now bone remodeling is where we find our sweet spot. Um, it's a continuous process. It happens all the time. It's where old brittle bone is removed and resorbed constantly and replaced by newer tissue. And this is done under the influence of various factors, including, including hormones. The process takes place every day in the micro cracks of our bones, which we don't even know that we make. And of course, when you do strenuous exercise and when there's a fracture. Some of the important bone, I mean, hormones that regulate bone modeling include calcium, calcitonin, parathyroid hormone, and vitamin D, which we'll get to later. Now this is where it becomes important for us. This is an excellent visual representation of what happens to your bone mass as you age. So women actually reach their peak of their bone mass in early adulthood almost with quite a, a steady decline after the menopause. So this is exactly why we need to talk about this bone health situation. Um, and we're going to go into the modifiable and the non-modifiable factors that affect women. Um, the modifiable factors are nutrition, exercise, weight, and environmental factors. These are important because even before the menopause, you can actually um, adjust and intervene based on those modifiable factors. And then, of course, the non-modifiable factors are age, which we've already discussed. And then chronic illness, medication, reproductive health and a history of breast and, in fact, gynecological cancer, which we're going to chat about in more detail. So, <clears throat> premenopausal bone health. We're going to take it in stages, right? These are the important dietary constituents that either promote or adversely affect bone health. Um, you have the micronutrients, and then we're going to chat about the macronutrients later. Calcium and vitamin D is relatively self-explanatory. We know we need calcium to make bone, and we know we need vitamin D to make bone. The interesting things about these um, micronutrients is that calcium, the bioavailability in calcium, is actually better in calcium-containing foods rather than in supplementation itself. So the advice or the recommendations is, in fact, to adjust diet rather than to add supplementation. Vitamin D, we know is required, and most of our vitamin D comes from sunlight, but not everybody lives in sunny South Africa. Um, and unfortunately, dietary sources of vitamin D are quite, um, are quite limited. So the recommendation for vitamin D supplementation is that we should be giving 
women younger than 70, 600 international units and women over the age of 70, 800 international units for them to actually meet their requirement. Um, vitamin D in bone formation is quite, it's quite iffy because it's good for vit vitamin, uh, I beg your pardon, for bone formation, but in excess, it's toxic. So um, luckily, I don't think we find a lot of vitamin A toxicity, but it's just important to note that we shouldn't be flooding patients with vitamins necessarily just because we think that it's going to improve their bone health. <clears throat> and then, of course, just briefly, it is important to note that phosphorus, magnesium, and even vitamin K are essential in bone formation, but there's no recommendation about whether or not it should be supplemented. The broad macronutrients are protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So bone mass can only adequately be maintained if you have optimal protein intake. Protein is important because it actually forms the largest component of your bone matrix. Um, a high protein intake is actually protective of your bone mineral density, especially in the lumbar spine, but there isn't clear evidence about whether or not it has an effect on your overall bone mineral density. The evidence has also suggested that fat intake decreases calcium absorption. So a diet high in fat is not good for your bone mineral density. And high carbohydrate intake, sadly, has detrimental effects on bone health. Yeah, emotional eating. Um, that's just broadly on diet, then exercise. Right, so the mechanostat theory is a well-described theory that refers to bone responding to mechanical forces that are placed on them. For this reason, your bone strength can be correlated directly to the strain it has to accommodate. This is clearly demonstrated with exercise, especially weight-bearing exercises. It reduces your fracture risk and actually increases your bone mineral density. And there's reason to believe that because some of your bone mineral density is achieved in childhood and early adolescence, that is actually the time to intervene. So it's recommended that exercise to um, prevent osteoporosis starts in childhood rather than in your late 30s, just to be in mind. Um, and then even for the postmenopausal woman, there still seems to be some benefit to exercise, exercise in the postmenopausal woman with a high resistance training program proven to be effective in improving their bone mineral density. In terms of the environmental factors, we can talk about alcohol and lead and all those things, but I chose to focus on smoking because smoking actually affects your bone density in a various array of ways. So it decreases your parathyroid hormone and your estrogen, which obviously will have a detrimental effect to bone. It increases your cortisol and androgens and therefore promotes bone resorption. It reduces your vitamin D, increases free radicals, decreases blood supply to your bone, decreases your muscle mass, and therefore makes you more at risk for fall, and it's toxic to your bone cells. So there's nothing good about smoking and bone health. So this should actually be counseled quite early. Weight and bone health, in a nutshell, is complicated. Um, because you both an increased BMI and a decreased BMI has been found to increase your fracture risk. The problem with the decreased BMI patients is that usually if they have a decreased BMI enough that, that it's affected their bone mineral density, they also have issues around amenorrhea. So it's unclear whether the cause of the decreased bone mineral density is in fact because of that or if it's because of the decreased BMI by itself. And then of course, the increase for the patients with very increased BMIs are also at risk for fractures, and it's been found that patients with an increased visceral fat, so visceral adiposity, is more at risk of decreases in their bone mineral density than those patients with a peripheral distribution of their adiposity. Okay, <clears throat> the non-modifiable factors are a little bit more fun and gyne-related. Reproductive effects on bone health. <clears throat> estrogen, huh, yes, estrogen is critically important in bone health in women, like the most important. The reason why is because estrogen actually inhibits um, osteoclast activity, and that's how it promotes osteoblast activity, and that's why it's so important in maintaining female bone health. Um, it also has an inhibitory effect on the rank ligand, which is a part of a very complicated cycle of bone resorption and bone formation. Um, and that's why regular menstrual cycles are actually an important indicator of bone health. If you have a normal cycle, you should have normal estrogen and therefore your bone health should be okay. Um, and it also then clearly illustrates why as soon as you hit the menopause, there's a big problem with bone health and patients with primary amenorrhea 
secondary amenorrhea and premature ovarian insufficiency should then also be screened for osteoporosis. And you should always be remember that should be think you should be thinking about their bone mineral density if they present with those problems. Something else to remember is that pregnancy places a large calcium demand on our women, um, and they are actually more prone to resorption and osteoporosis. Luckily, the resorption um, post-pregnancy should be reversed, um, especially if it's followed by breastfeeding, but we must just be careful for those short interval pregnancies, multigravid patients, because then they're basically almost constantly in a state of resorption. Um, <clears throat> in terms of contraception, the combined oral contraceptive and the progesterone only pill has no effect on bone health, so that's okay. However, Depo-Provera has been found to cause a transient decrease in your bone mineral density. Luckily, it is transient and it can be regained after a short time of stopping, but there are countries that kind of put a black box warning on Depo-Provera that prevents people from using it for longer than two years because of the concern about the decrease in their bone mineral density and they should actually have full recovery of the um, bone mass within one to two years of discontinuation. Um, a quick note about hysterectomy and oophorectomy. We're going to talk about some of this more when we talk about the cancers, but patients who've had an oophorectomy specifically have estrogen and androgen deficiency, which obviously will affect their calcium metabolism and their bone mineral density, and they actually have a risk of hip spine and wrist fracture about 54%, which is quite high. So we must remember that when we're doing all these oophorectomies. Okay. Um, all right, postmenopausal bone health. Um, advancing age is the most common risk factor for osteoporosis. It has been found that about 1.4 million women over the age of 50 in South Africa suffer from osteoporosis. Um, osteoporosis accelerates that loss of estrogen and protection, um, and that's mainly the effect that it has. And the risk stratification that is done with, consider with consideration of the modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors should always be done in our patients, even if they're just hitting the menopause. You should bear in mind what all the other risk factors were, even pre-menopause. <coughs> so some of the interventions that can be done is you can um, introduce vitamin supplementation, and we'll talk a little bit more about when to start treating patients just now. You can encourage weight-bearing exercises, tobacco avoidance, and then of course avoidance of fall hazards for those people who are at risk. This is a very heavy slide, and um, there's more information about medical illnesses that have an effect on bone health um, for various reasons, but this is quite a nice slide because it lists some of the commonly used medications and how they affect bone. So it's important to note that the glucocorticoids are a problem. They increase fracture risk, um, and you can actually, depending on the indication for the glucocorticoid, of course, you can actually use a bisphosphonate to prevent bone loss if they have to be on it long term. Um, some of the anti-epileptics inactivate vitamin D, and that's why they have an increased fracture risk. And then some of the PPIs as well decrease calcium absorption, inhibit the osteoclasts, and um, I beg your pardon, they inhibit osteoblasts, that's a mistake on my part, I beg your pardon. So they also increase the factor risk of your hip, spine and wrists. The aromatase inhibitors, which we sometimes use, and the GnRH agonists, which we also sometimes use because they decrease the estrogen, that's essentially why they would affect your bone health. So it's important when you're starting patients on these medications to bear in mind what it's doing to your bone mineral density. Breast cancer and bone health. Breast cancer survivors, we know that the mortality of breast cancer has decreased, but the survivors of breast cancer are at an increased risk of fracture for various number of reasons. The physical tumor effect on the bone has effect on itself. Therapies that they use that affect estrogen metabolism like tamoxifen can also affect your bone health. And of course, because their mortality is improving, they approach menopause. So now they've had tumor effects on their bones, they've had tamoxifen, they're menopausal, and then sometimes they have glucocorticoids on board as well. So they're just a sitting duck for osteoporosis. So when we're seeing these patients, we mustn't forget that that is in fact their background. Gynecological cancers. Um, <coughs> sorry. 
Patients with gyne um, gynecological cancers are also at increased risk of osteoporosis, also for multiple reasons. A lot of it has to do with obviously the tumor and the cancer effect on their body systemically. Um, the fact that some of them actually require an oophorectomy if they're going to have surgical interventions for their cancer, and then the adjuvant therapies that we provide them, including chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and hormonal therapy. Sorry, I jumped the gun. So chemotherapy is interesting because there is some data su to suggest that patients who just get chemotherapy are at an increased risk of um, osteoporosis regardless, so completely independent of whether or not they had an oophorectomy. Um, and this, this was actually found in a study in premenopausal women who had chemotherapy for a gynae malignancy. Radiotherapy has been found to be largely associated with significant bone loss and pelvic insufficiency fractures. Um, there's an incidence of up to 12% of these fractures in patients um, who've received radiotherapy. And then just to mention again, hormonal therapy that we sometimes use, including the aromatase inhibitors, are commonly used, but they will decrease your bone mineral density because they decrease your circulating estrogen. So we must just remember that these are the things that we need to be thinking about when we're treating our gynae cancer patients. I apologize for this very small slide. I will send you guys the article on the group because it's actually really nice how they've summed this up. Osteoporosis, as we know, is a decrease in your bone mass and you have microarchitectural strangers to your bone that leads to an increased fracture risk. There are lots of organizations that have lots of recommendations on osteoporosis, when to treat, who to screen. Um, it includes the American College, it includes the National Osteoporosis Foundation, they all here. And all of them have a different guideline for who gets DEXA screening. The by and large, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought, but by and large, the guidelines all agree that you should offer DEXA screening of the hip and lumbar spine to all women over the age of 65. Um, and they also think that premenopausal women with significant risk factors should, might actually benefit from DEXA screening. So some of the guidelines actually say that if, you're, if she's premenopausal even, or if she's 50, but she has a large amount of, large, of risk factors, I beg your pardon, then you should get a DEXA screen and you should watch her bone mineral density. <clears throat> so once you've risk stratified your patient, you've now seen her, you've assessed her age, you've done a history, you've done an examination, she's had a DEXA test, now it's that T-score. So I don't know about you guys, but until I did this presentation, the T-score was a myth to me. I was just like, I don't even know. Essentially, the T-score makes sense now. It is a normal distribution. It's all, I actually, this is how I understand it. It is a normal distribution. It is on a chart. So if your bone mineral density is close to the mean, it is normal. As it moves away from the mean, as it is with any normal distribution, the more standard deviations it is away, the worse your bone mineral density is, the higher your T-score, and the more likely you are to have severe osteoporosis. So this is the WHO's classification, actually, of how to interpret T-scores. Um, I can also say that it's also in the article, of one of the articles that I used, but you can see that as you move away, then the osteoporosis becomes more severe, essentially. Good. Osteoporosis treatment. Prevention, prevention, prevention. So early intervention, of course, adjust the modifiable risk factors in the premenopausal woman, if you can. Um, some of the evidence has suggested that supplementation can be beneficial, but it's not without risk. So we shouldn't actually be throwing calcium at anyone, um, but it could be beneficial, and that's why you have to risk stratify your patient first. And then um, pharmacotherapy can be considered if the fracture risk is high. So there's a FRAX, FRAX prediction that you can actually do. There's an app and there's, there's lots of information on the internet about it. But you essentially plug in the demographic of your patient, the age, her risk factors, her weights. It gives you a fracture risk score for her. If you couple that with everything else, then you might have an indication of whether or not she needs pharmacotherapy or not. I beg your pardon. Right. right. So the guidelines have suggested that you should <coughs> initiate osteoporosis treatment for patients who have a history of vertebral and hip fractures. If their T-score is minus 2.5 at the femoral neck, hip or lumbar spine, or in women over the age, any woman over the age of 50 with osteopenia, penia on the DEXA score, 
on their DEXA scan, I beg your pardon, um, who have a 10-year hip fracture probability of more than 3%, which you would find on your FRAX predictor tool, or a 10-year major osteoporosis-related factor of more than 20%. Those patients you should strongly consider treating for their osteoporosis. The pharmacotherapy options are bisphosphonates, which we've all heard of and some of us have prescribed. Um, it is first line. The only risk factor is that it can cause atypical fractures and osteonecrosis, so the indication must be there and you must be sure that the benefit then outweighs the risk. Calcitonin can also be prescribed. It's mostly for pain relief for acute compressive fra compression fractures, but it can actually increase your cancer risk according to the literature. Um, your SIRMs, so your selective estrogen receptor modulators, can be used uh, on postmenopausal women who are at high risk of breast cancer specifically. Unfortunately, it will increase their menopausal symptoms and it increases the, the thromboembolic event. Um, so again, risk benefits. Hormone replacement therapy is interesting. So the literature suggests that you should only give hormone replacement therapy to patients who you think, who you think are symptomatic. So if she, it only reduces the fracture risk in patients who are symptomatic. So unfortunately, we can't give HRT to every postmenopause wound, which we already know for other reasons. But if you're thinking about bone health specifically, it's not necessarily going to reduce her fracture risk. And it has, comes with its own problems, which is an increase of thromboembolic events and sometimes breast cancer. Then there are other things which I have never seen, to be honest, like human parathyroid hormone which will increase your bone mineral density, but you should only use it for two years, um, according to the guidelines, because there's a risk of osteosarcoma, and then you have a, ra a rank ligand inhibitor. Never seen it before, but these, this can be used for very high-risk women, women really who are gonna, guaranteed, have severe osteoporosis, um, but they are also then at risk of hypocalcemia. Right, so that was a bit of a whirlwind. The point is, osteoporosis and bone health in women is multifactorial. You have to identify modifiable risk factors early and intervene. Um, you should know who's at risk, and you should risk stratify them premenopausally already. Don't wait until that horrible loss of your bone mineral density at the menopause. Um, treat appropriately. Oncology patients are at risk. Um, it's probably just the junior in me, but you, I kind of don't really think past the diagnosis sometimes. And when you read stuff like this, it makes you think that you should actually just take a moment to realize where our oncology of patients are going and treat them appropriately. Are there any questions at this time? Sorry, it was very fast. <laughs> Thanks, Sherry Lee, for your great presentation, <laughs> which was done post-call, I might add. Um, can you just tell us about calcium again? When yes. should we prescribe calcium in the postmenopausal woman? So only, actually, you can prescribe calcium in a postmenopausal woman at risk. Okay. But you shouldn't treat them for osteoporosis unless they are symptomatic. So calcium supplementation is appropriate if the patient is at risk for osteoporosis, if she has multiple risk factors, but um, the treatment with bisphosphonates and stuff is only reserved, or the treatment with HRT, I beg your pardon, is only reserved for patients who are symptomatic. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I just wanted to ask about vitamin D on that bone. Mm. Perfect. So, um, it's, it's, the literature says you can consider supplementation. So it depends on where you are and it depends on whether or not the patient is actually deficient. So if you think that there is a deficiency, then if they're younger than 70, you can give them 600 international units weekly. And if they're older than 70, then 800 international week, uh, units weekly. But it's definitely not a broad, um, a broad guide, like a, I mean, a, it's not directed specifically that everybody must get vitamin D. It depends on where you live, whether they get enough through absorption, whether there are dietary, um, dietary sources of vitamin D available to your patient, and then you can consider supplementation. So many questions. For vitamin D? I actually don't know. I suppose you could, I didn't actually read that, um, to be honest, but I suppose if you think that the patient is deficient for some reason, you probably could. Mm 
but it's not clearly written in the literature that you should do a vitamin D level. It just says that you should stratify your patient and bear in mind that a vitamin D deficiency is a possibility in some places and in some patients. They actually just told me selective estrogen receptor modulators. There's no genetic, according to the article from 2018, they don't, they don't list a genetic predisposition, but I think the predisposition will come with the other things. So there might be a predisposition to other non-modifiable or modifiable risk factors that would then make you at risk. I'll have to find an article on that. <laughs> um, but it is vegan diets are high protein. No, they aren't. Are they not? Uh -uh. Don't they eat protein? I actually don't have an article on that, to be honest. Um, but if they don't have a high protein intake, then the bone mineral density is going to be problematic. I'll find an article on vegans and bone mineral density. <laughs> that could be a fun read. <laughs> women and their problems which included this so what happened since I was there was actually WHI trial that changed um, clinical management of hormone replacement therapy in the world so my question to to Sherry is that the 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 comment that you made on hormone replacement therapy and breast cancer can you maybe just give us more information about that? Because this is one of the biggest concerns for, mm. for women is since the WHI trial that there was an increased incidence of breast cancer. But can you elaborate a little bit on, on what, what was found? So the guideline says that you have to, unfortunately, it sounds like I'm repeating myself, but they said you should risk stratify your patient essentially. So if she is menopausal, symptomatic, and has no other risk factors for breast cancer, um, then you can consider hormone replacement therapy only if she's symptomatic. But if the risk for breast cancer kind of supersedes the symptoms of her menopause, then that shifts then, and then hormone replacement therapy for bone protection is then probably not recommended. Yeah, maybe I can just make a comment is that what I understood in the beginning is that there were two arms in that trial <coughs> and the one arm was where you use combined therapy um, in the patient who still had the uterus in mm. place and then in the other arm those, those were just where you received uh, uh, estrogen mm. and they had a hysterectomy now if I can take you a little bit back in history Professor Davy who ran that mm. clinic when we gave combined hormone replacement therapy and any patient who developed an abnormal bleeding immediately almost was uh, scheduled for hysterectomy. Mm. It was almost an indication for hysterectomy. And then after that hysterectomy, they actually continued with uh, um, estrogen hormone replacement therapy. Now, once they found a higher incidence of um, breast cancer and it was it's minute actually mm. if you look at the amount mm. it was minute but it was uh, in the trial they said they will discontinue the trial if they find that even that minute 
increase. So they discontinued that arm of the trial. But in the arm of the trial where the hysterectomy was performed, it was not found, and they completed mm. that trial. Mm. That's why there's controversy, mm. and I feel we must know about this, and then we have to go and look and see maybe what is the latest mm. on those organizations that you say there's no agreement that one can see what is the guideline exactly now, mm. the latest on that controversy. Okay. Maybe somebody knows, but mm. some of our candidates so know. There is newer evidence that say what, there's two different schools of thought or two different things that we must think of. Somebody at risk of breast cancer and somebody that had or that previous breast cancer and then hormonal replacement for them. And if they've had or obviously currently, but even if they've had previous, the consensus now in the world is not to give any hormonal replacement. And then if you have osteoporosis risk factors, to start by with your modifiable things and you do, if you have any other menopause symptoms, do your topical estrogen still fine, mm. but then you can't give them oral hormonal okay. replacement therapy, and then you will do your exercise and all of the other things for osteoporosis. But if you have a risk, then that's a different story. Then it seems like you will give it, and there's definitely a benefit for Mm. Proven, not really a proven increased risk, new evidence for um, breast cancer. Okay, maybe there is the answer. Mm. Okay? So just a little bit of background and then what is the latest uh, uh, um, recommendation? So, um, no, we, 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 we're dancing on this topic, but yeah. it sounds like intermediate hyperplasia and, and bleeding or risk, uh, risk there. But my understanding was always that if you, for example, in the case where you have an intrauterine hormonal device, for example, and you want to keep on screening um, a woman for a risk of is it going to be hyperplasia or perhaps a possibility of malignancy, can't we then in those women who do have bleeding after we initiate them on, on hormonal therapy, take the same approach, maybe either call them or hysteroscopy them? You know, or yeah, them. That, that is very old. No, 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 no. I, I, I know, but I'm, I'm asking like in this sort of setting, you know, when you do do the replacement and you do get a bleed, yeah. is there not a place in, in this specific candidate to do that? Just to do a propel? Well, that or to go and look with, with the hysteroscopy and follow them up every three or six months, etc., cetera, and then, and then see then instead of going the route of no hormonal replacement therapy when your conservative measures fail. Because if your conservative measures fail, what do you do then? You must live with it. That would be safe. With osteoporosis. Yes, yes. So, so hormone so. replacement is not proven to um, treat osteoporosis, yeah, but just to prevent. Yeah, to prevent yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think that that's the most important point, that that mm -hmm. sentence is your take home. Yeah. That, that is, it's a good slide, but it shouldn't be treatment. 